Welcome, everyone. Great to see all of you. This is the fourth of a great series that we had fun putting together um, as it relates to kind of just thinking outside the box with medical education, outside of the core kind of qualities of education and pedagogy and whatnot. Uh, and my longtime friend and colleague, Shauna, has been a part of the BEI efforts for many years. And we were actually reminiscing about what we did before the pandemic and now kind of reinventing the after. So thank you again, Shauna. From our Department of Radiology, a colleague, a fellow educator, and uh, has had so many roles through the year that most of us know. But I'm going to turn it over to you. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you everyone for coming and for the invitation to give this uh, talk on games and gamification in medical education. So I want to start by saying I am definitely not an expert on the topic. It's just something I'm interested in and I like to play around with. Um, I'm curious if anyone in the room or on Zoom has used games or ga gamification in their teaching before. Maybe raise your hand if you have. All right, we have a few in the room, hopefully some on Zoom as well. Um, so I hope by the end of this talk, you'll be inspired to maybe try some of the things I'm going to show you out um, in your own teaching. So I like to start some of my education talks with this clip. In some of you may have seen it the before. The Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone, the Great Depression, passed the, <laughs> anyone, anyone, the tariff bill, the Hawley Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs <laughs> in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone? I hope not to effect? see any of these kinds of faces today in the crowd. In the um, but I like to show this um, clip, one, because it helps me identify people in my generation or maybe the generation below me because the current learners have never seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Um, but I think it's um, telling because this is this is the old school model of teaching, right? This right. is the um, sort of uh, sage on the stage where we all stand up here kind of like I'm doing right now. Don't worry, it won't be like this the whole time. Um, and I'm distilling knowledge to you and it's really sort of passive learning. Um, and I think we're moving towards this model of the guide on the side where the learners are really doing the meat of the work um, and they're being guided by the teacher um, instead of being taught to. Um, and, you know, our current generation of learners grew up with technology, like literally at their fingertips. Um, they're the digital natives and they're used to having fast paced access to information and interactive technology, and they don't want to sit in a classroom and be lectured at. Um, so this has really led to the shift in our educational practices where we use more active learning um, to, to distill knowledge. So, in a, you know, separate from passive learning where we're just speaking to you, you know, we're now trying to engage learners to use their brains during the learning process and engage with the content in a different way um, rather than passive learning. So there's so many ways that we can integrate active learning into our teaching. So Things we can do are pause, whether it's for like a silent, you know, think to yourself, something, you know, some sort of reflection, um, or have your students write a reflection um, based on something that you're teaching. You can have them brainstorm ideas. You can have them do problem solving or a case discussion is more interactive than, you know, telling them what the case is. Um, they can do drawing or diagramming. They can do no stakes quizzes or questions, worksheets. Um, think, pair, share people have used before where you have students reflect or write on something for a minute or two and then share with a colleague and then share with the classroom. Um, and role playing is another one. So these are all ways that the teacher can sort of have the students engage with the content, um, bring it a step further than just hearing it um, and, and then forgetting about it. <laughs> um, and in doing these things, you can also gauge the student's progress and, you know, you can tweak your teaching in the moment based on, you know, how you perceive them to be, you know, understanding the content. Um, but importantly, one thing I left off this list is gamification, which we'll focus on today. So we're going to get the brain, the brains moving. Okay. So Gamification um, has a lot of definitions in the literature, um, which actually makes studying it kind of difficult because there are so many ways to define it. But in summary, it is basically using game elements in non-gaming contexts. So using um, action language or assessment or a competition or role-playing or scoring points, leaderboard, badges, things like that, or prizes and rewards. Um, so this isn't contradistinction to something that's also in the literature, which is called serious games, which is where the game is actually um, 
is the game in which education is the primary goal rather than entertainment. So the difference here between like gamifying your education and a serious game is the designer's intent. So a serious game is a game that's created to educate someone, whereas gamification is taking content that you want to teach and gamifying it, making it part of a game. Um, so different ways we can do educational games. So one is simulations and role playing. So examples where we might do this is where we want to replicate a real situation or a guided experience. Um, examples where this has been done in the literature is like endoscopy or ACLS training. We can create virtual environments. Um, these are typically visually rich um, and incorporate engaging web applications. We can do social and cooperative games. So these are based on interactions with other players. Um, commonly used are like um, sort of mimicking board games or TV game shows. And then alternative reality games where you mix gameplay in real life um, to challenge players to discover or solve a mystery. So a very simple search on PubMed really demonstrates that gamification in medical education has been exponentially growing in the past 10 years. So you can see, I think the only reason this bar is low is because we haven't quite finished 2023 out yet. Um, but it has clearly grown and, you know, I got over 1500 hits, uh, which is pretty impressive. So there's a lot of literature out there. And, you know, you may be thinking, well, why even bother with gamification? What does it work? What, you know, why? Um, so there, in the literature, there are a lot of um, adult learning theories that have been um, suggested to be the reason why gamification works. And I thought it was worth sort of talking about a few of the most prominent ones. Um, so the first one is Cole's experiential learning theory. So back in 1985, Cole des described this um, process of learning as the way that we um, turn knowledge is sort of created by the transformation of experience. And it's sort of this like cycle that we go through as we engage with new knowledge. So the thought here is that we have some sort of concrete experience, perhaps it's playing some sort of a game or being in a lecture. And then we um, reflect on that learning. Um, then we try to make sense of that learning. That's the abstract con conceptualization. And then we, you know, try to go a step further and use what we have learned, um, test our knowledge or skills. And then again, we move to having that experience and it sort of goes in a cycle. And so some have suggested that educational games or gamifying learning can enhance the reflection and conceptualization um, part of Cole's learning theory um, to then use during these concrete experiences. Another theory that has been suggested as part of the reason gamification works is deliberate practice. So this was coined um, by Anders Ericsson, and it's a theory about how we become experts in our fields. And um, it posits basically that um, mindful, um, goal-oriented, repetitive practice of a highly motivated person um, who's working at their at and above their current level of competence with a coach and receiving very targeted specific feedback, um, but eventually with many times and practices will lead to expertise. And so um, people have proposed that gamification specifically supports these facets, but especially um, the sort of motivation factor and the fact that you have someone coaching you and guiding you through the, the process. Self-directed learning is another theory um, that sort of focuses on having your learners um, formulate their own individual learning goals and plan their own individual learning trajectory as opposed to us telling them what they're going to learn. Um, and that leads to a sense of autonomy. And then in addition, to, by adding these gamification factors, competition or prizes leads to increased motivation to learn which leads to learning. Um, so again, sort of motivation, I think, again, is the factor here that, um, that leads to this increased learning. And then the final theory that I wanted to talk about is the social comparison theory. So um, really by nature as humans, we make judgments about ourselves based on how we compare ourselves to others. It's sort of a natural thing that we do for better or for worse. Um, and ideally, we would compare ourselves to others that are relatively equal to us. Um, but much of the time, the comparison is somewhat upward or somewhat downward. Um, so in in theory, downward comparisons can lead us to having feelings of superiority or have a positive effect on our self-confidence, um, whereas upward comparisons can cause us to seek self-enhancement, 
um, because we want to improve to be like that person. But depending on the circumstance or someone's personality traits, it could also leave them feeling inadequate or with a lower self-concept. So this is something that we have to, you know, sort of tread lightly with. Um, but the theory here is that the use of competition, such as a leaderboard or prizes, can provide the learner an opportunity for both upward and downward comparison. Um, and in theory, should increase, again, motivation to improve our knowledge and skills. Okay, so with a little bit of understanding about some of the theories that might back games and gamification, I thought we would try some of them. Um, so we'll start with Pull Everywhere, which I think is um, a tool that a lot of people are familiar with. And here at HMS, we actually have access to like the free upgraded version. So I like to share it because it's something we can all use for free. Um, so I'll just show you a quick sort of video about how you create a game on Pull Everywhere. So this is the little app that you download. Um, and then um, in the right-hand corner, you click New Activity. And then you'll see a bunch of options come up. And the first, the third one in is competition. So you click that. And it basically creates this completely blank com uh, competition program that you can use. And then in the upper right-hand corner, again, you'll click Edit. And then it allows you to pick um, different features that you can personalize. So obviously you can create the title of the competition um, and then you can select different features. So some of those things are like, do you allow your learners to change their answers if they change their mind? Is it going to be time-based? Are you going to set limits on, you know, how much time they have to answer the question um, and so on and so forth. And then um, you can see here. We're going to put in our title. We're going to call it the BEI competition. We're going to put in a new question. Um, which it will be a multiple choice question. You'll see shortly, you can add an image with that question if you want or not. The answers can have images if you want or not. You can have more than one answer if you want. So you can see two are selected. Um, so it gives you a lot of flexibility in creating your multiple choice questions. And then once you've created all your questions, you um, hit insert slides and it automatically gets put into your slideshow. So I'm gonna show you now what that looks like. Um, so, if you'll all pull out your electronic devices, um, you'll go to pullevev.com slash Shauna Madeline. I'm sorry, I should have an easier name for this. <laughs> and we'll let everyone get logged in. You can make up a fake name if you want or not. It doesn't, doesn't have to be anonymous, but... All right, and in, in the room, raise your hand if you're logged in. Okay, need a little more time. Okay, yeah, perfect. Okay, I'm gonna move to the first question. And so um, it should pop up on your device. It's not working. Oh, hold on. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> okay. And then I go to the next slide and it should show me. Perfect. So we agree. The sky is blue. Perfect. Okay. Next question, what entity is shown here? So this might be something you could use in radiology or another specialty. <laughs> I know. Hopefully the two ultrasonographers in the room know the answer to this one. <laughs> can, can I tell people it's my favorite non-essential organ? <laughs> it is, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> okay. So we have our answer. It's gallstone. Good job to those who got that. And so, you know, if you were teaching this in real time, obviously you could talk, you know, if you had people who had the wrong answer, you could talk about why this is the right answer, why, how the, how the other answer would look differently and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, the, the goal is that you sort of show, and yay, we have a winner. So, and then at the end there's a winner and there could be a prize and um, the prize is actually in the other room with lots of desserts. <laughs> As much as you want. <laughs> All you can eat desserts. Um, can I, yeah. Can I ask? So, if, but if you were to put this in the midst of a, uh, this is freestanding. If you were to put this in the midst of a PowerPoint mm -hmm. presentation, like partway through a lecture, um, is that obvious to do with this? Or yeah. 
So I can actually show you. So this is actually embedded in the lecture I'm giving. Okay. So when you click um, add slides, it embeds it into whichever PowerPoint you have open. Okay. So, um, and then you can move them around. So say you want to do a quest, you know, a question and then, you know, five slides of content, you know, and then you can add another question. And then at the very end, you can put the leaderboard at okay. the end of the lecture. So you can move them around just like slides. Okay. Yeah. So it's very, it's, I love the poll everywhere because it's actually quite easy to use once you've used it once or twice. So why everybody has 2000 <laughs> points. So why was one person first, second, and third? Um, probably right? based on the speed of how you so answer. they do measure speed? I think so. And I'm going to show you Kahoot next, which okay, actually does. Yeah. yeah. Can I point out that Dr. Derby seems to be a little competitive. <laughs> 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 See, and it's, it's motivating you to learn, right? It's motivating you. Maybe not such a good Well, we'll get to that later, actually. We will get to that later. I have a question about this really uh, fast because because you said that you can embed it. Yes. Um, ha have you tried to embed it into into um, any sort of like educational software such as Canvas, Brightspace, anything like that? I have not. Um, you do have. I pull everywhere. Typically, is a live use. I, I've only ever used it live. I think they okay. have offline functions where you can make like a take home test essentially or something like that. Um, and people can do things on their own time with a link. Um, but I've only ever done it live. And in the background on my computer, I have the Poll Everywhere app running, which is why this is working right now. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah, there is a little bit of nuance there. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to move on to Kahoot, which is very similar um, for those of you who have used it. So I'm going to just flip into here and the only up here is I got to find my mouse. Here we go. Okay, so we're going to start a Kahoot. Not so easy to move them out. Here we go. Okay, so everyone will join Kahoot. It'll tell you how to do it in just a second. <laughs> Let me just drag this over for a second because it's hard to use the second screen. Okay, here we go, classic mode. Okay, so you're gonna go to kahoot.it and you're gonna type in this game pin or if I can move that, you can also use the QR code if that works for your camera. And then I believe as you start to put your names in. I like his music. Yes. It does have some music too. <laughs> you can you can uh, personalize the music, right? I think you can personalize like the way the background looks, the music. Yeah. Some of these features require an upgrade, which I don't have. <laughs> I have the free version, but there is a free version, which is pretty easy to use and you can use for up to 40 players. So it's not like you have to buy the um, advanced version. All right, great. We have some participants. So I think we'll get started. You know, we have a radiology has. I do know that. Yeah. Um, and you can get like institutional subscriptions yeah. too, which is not too expensive. Um, and you're sharing all of your stuff. Okay. So. All right. We're going to start with the first question. Boston themed questions here. <laughs> and the faster you answer, the more points you get. So Boston is a city in the Northwest, You're Southwest, the Northeast. <laughs> but it is kind of weird that on the screen it comes up that is as like just a, the signal, like the a, symbols a, and the a, colors, a shape right? Color, yeah, right. yeah. All right. So it might be a way to make it more interactive because at that point you don't have a whole room like this. They actually have to look up them. That's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and you can include. Maybe, maybe. You'll see soon. You can include images. All right, Linda in the lead. Oh man. So we're gonna do question two. What is the name of the red line painted on the sidewalk? So you can include images here um, as well. So it's great for image rich 
specialties like radiology, pathology, dermatology. And it's very competitive because number one, I don't think you can change your answer once you've selected. And number two, the faster you answer, the more points you get. So, yeah. all right. Worth having comes easy. That's what I got. <laughs> there it is. Okay. And so we'll retally oh, the. Linda. Oh, Linda in the lead. Yeah. Okay. And then the last question the first Boston Marathon was held in what year? <laughs> And it's great because you can set a timer, but also once everyone in the class has answered, it just moves on. Um, no, I, 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 okay. So oh, the answer was 19, 1897. Wow. I should have looked at yours <laughs> when you were answering. <laughs> <laughs> right behind you. Okay. All right. Let's find out who the final winner is. So in third place, Peter, congratulations. In second place, Linda. Oh, someone yeah, ended up on top. Let's see. KB. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we, we know who knows their Boston trivia. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to close that out. But that's Kahoot. It's very easy to use. Um, it's fun. I think people have fun. It's very competitive, as you can see. Um, and you can do any multiple choice that questions. The That's the free version. So, you know, it's, you don't need anything too fancy. I, which is I nice. found using Kahoot, though, if you want to put pictures, they're very, very small. small. They are smaller. Yeah. As you saw there. Um, so that's Kahoot. Um, so, you know, if you want to create your own, you go to create in the right hand corner. And then you can choose a blank campus, a canvas or use their templates. And then you can see on the right hand side, you can do all different themes and make it kind of fun. But, you know, I think those things are kind of like extraneous and then very simple questions, answers. You can add more than four options if you want. You can add images if you want. So there's a lot of different ways that you can personalize the, the content, which is great. Okay, so um, then I want to share some other I think relatively simple ways to incorporate gamification into things like PowerPoint that we use all the time. Um, so this is on MedEd Portal, which if you haven't used it before, it's a great um, open access resource with lots of educational um, content. And there are a lot of gamification. I, I think I was able to find like up to 20 different gamification or like game type themed um, things on there. And you can see that um, on the web page, um, they have files included. So you just download the whole thing. It comes into like a little folder on your computer. And this one, which was um, done by a, a really amazing radiology educator um, who's up in Dartmouth, um, was uh, basically a radiology Jeopardy. Um, but anyone can use this. It's a blank Jeopardy PowerPoint, basically. So uh, this is what it looks like when you download it. And it isn't like the old school, like not widescreen, but that's okay. <laughs> um, and, you know, you go through it and you can create your own rules. And then you have the two interactive Jeopardy, you know, slides, you have regular Jeopardy, and then you can do double Jeopardy if you want. And each of those things is a link. So I'm going to show you in a second how it works. But what you would do is you would just basically create, you know, cases or questions or whatever you want for 100 points, 200 points, 300 points, and so on. Um, and then after each uh, question, you can do like an explanation slide. So our residents love this. This is pretty much exclusively what I do for resident conference. Um, it's very fun. You can divide the room into two teams, keep score, and then there's a winning team at the end, which is really fun. Um, so I'm going to show you how it's in. Jeopardy. All right, so I'm going to unshare that just for a second and share you, with you my Jeopardy show. It even Jeopardy. comes with music. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
So, you know, I would say the rules and, you know, each team gets a chance to pick the category. If you get it wrong, you lose points and the other team can steal. Um, there's even a double jeopardy one, you know, surprise double jeopardy. And so, you know, we can say here, oh, well, I would like to pick stomach for 300. And you can see this is the, the stomach case for 300 and the teams get together. They discuss amongst themselves. So it's sort of a team based activity, which is really great. Peer learning, all that good stuff. Um, and then they would say what they think the answer is. And then if, you know, they're right, we would move on to the educational slide where I can distill a tiny bit of content. Um, and then we would just go back to the main page. So very easy to use. It's pretty much foolproof because all the links and hyperlinks have been created for you. So if you have pre-existing sort of like case-based talks or even like multiple choice questions that you want to give, this is a really fun, interactive way to do it. Um, so back to the other slideshow. Um, all right. Another one I found on MedEd Portal recently while I was creating this talk is this one on Verboten, which is like a $10,000 pyramid type game or similar to the game Taboo, if any of you have ever played that. Um, and again, even though it was radiology and MedEd Portal, it could be easily translated for other specialties. And so Verboten stands for um, forbidden in German. And so the point is that you're given um, either like a diagnosis or an image or something, and there are certain words that you're not allowed to use to get your teammates to guess the answer. So the way you would play this is, you know, you'd have uh, two, two teams at least, or you could have more, and only one person gets to see what the, the answer is, and everyone else is turned around or in another room or whatever the case may be, and that teammate has to get the rest of their teammates to guess the diagnosis. So for example, this is a case of cholelithiasis or gallstones, and you're not allowed to use the word cholelithiasis or gallstones. And so, you know, if Eric was the teammate who was asking the rest of the team to guess it, the rest of the team would be turned around. And Eric might say, you know, something in the right, right upper quadrant, it lives under the liver, it can cause um, pain after eating, it can cause colic, and you know, the answer would be cholelithiasis. So um, it's a it's sort of a fun way to play this game. So you know, they might guess polyp at first, and then you would say no, it causes shadowing on ultrasound, and then they would get the answer right. So kind of like word charades. Word charades, yes. <laughs> and um, I grew up playing taboo, so this was a game that I was familiar with, where it comes with these cards, and the top, the top word is the word you want your teammates to guess, and the bottom words are the words that you can't use. So you could definitely make a taboo for medical things. So I tried to come up with some myself. So pulmonary embolism, words you couldn't use to have your teammates guess are like PE, lungs, clot, thrombus, DVT, and you'd have to use other words or description. So you might say a patient who's laying in bed all day suddenly becomes tachycardic and um, is having trouble breathing. And then you would hope that your teammates would guess the answer. Um, so you could come up with some fun things like this um, and make your, make your students think really hard about how to explain the diagnosis um, in, in different ways. Another really fun one that I saw again in the radiology literature was um, this total revamping of curriculum with a gamification of thrones theme. Um, so what they did was they, they saw that their re residents attendance was really poor and they wanted to in increase their residents coming to a conference. And so they divided the residency into four houses, a la game of thrones. So they had like the Starks, the Targaryens and so on. Mm -hmm. And faculty were asked to adapt their content to include some sort of active learning technique. So whether it was like multiple choice questions or, um, or um, like some sort of like Jeopardy or, you know, thing like that. And they were given 20 points during their talk that they could allot to this, the learners. Um, and then at the end of the year, there would be um, a crowning <laughs> at the graduation. And then for the rest of the next year, their house banner would be put up in the conference room um, <laughs> as to show their honor. Um, so it was, it was really cute. You know, I, I have no follow-up on whether they continued to do this since this uh, the two or three years that they did it for the, the paper, but I thought that was pretty fun, and I'm sure our residents would probably get pretty into that as well. Um, Can yeah. I ask a question? Of course. Um, so we've tried this in radiology, and sometimes I, it's been frustrating as the person who's trying to adapt my lecture <laughs> because, and then eight people show up, and yes. it's like, was it worth the effort and stuff like that? The other concern that I have is... I, I have to get through like this amount of material 
And I'm concerned that with gamification, even though it'll be more fun, we're going to get through this amount yeah. of material. And is that, like, has that been worn out? Is there a way, um, do you know what I mean? How do you balance? I know exactly what you mean. So the question for the audience uh, on, the, on Zoom is that, you know, when we incorporate things like this, it's hard to get through a lot of content. And it, has that been discussed at all in the literature? And how do we deal and, with that? And in terms of preparing for boards, the onus is then put back on the residents mm -hmm. to be like, okay, it was fun, but we got through 20% of the material. Good luck to you figuring out the rest of the 80%. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think this is a really important um, idea, and I will get to it later in the talk. So I'm going to leave you in the dark for one second, if that's okay. Question about her question. Yeah, we have another follow up question. You know, she may get through 20%, but will that 20%, will they remember that 100%? Or she just went through the other way, you know, got through the 100% of her stuff, would they only remember 20% of what she's teaching? Yeah. About the game so the, can they hear like yeah. in the room? Uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so I won't repeat the question. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit as well. So I'm going to I'm going to put those thoughts on hold and keep you guessing for a few minutes. Um, I, I think I only have one or two more things to sort of mention. Um, so escape rooms, which I think some people have probably done. I know Sarah has done one with our residents, not a radiology escape room, just like a standard escape room, but they're fun. And um, I think they're kind of novel and people are into them these days. So they can be analog where you actually like go somewhere and have physical objects and have to get out of an actual room or they can be digital. Digital, um, especially with COVID, a lot of the escape rooms that I was reading about had to be translated to a digital version. So um, this one was one that I've seen um, actually at some of our meetings, they had this escape room that you could sign up to do. And um, it was pretty well received. These are some pictures from the escape room. They had it both in their um, residency, but then they also brought it on the road to our biggest national or really international meeting here at RSNA, which was just held um, last week. Um, and so, uh, you know, they had both mental and physical, like sort of technical radiology, um, procedural skill puzzles, and then each puzzle, um, has a solution and the sum of the solutions is supposed to help you escape the room at the very end. And so, um, some examples that they gave were that they had like matching or naming classic imaging diagnoses. They had, um, like identification of neuroanatomy on CT and MRI. Uh, they had assessment of proper ultrasound techniques. So that was more of like a physical skill that you had to show. Um, they had to identify a hidden code within an ultrasound phantom. Um, so that was kind of cute, like a physical skill and then had to be able to also interpret the image <laughs> as well. Um, but, you know, this is, this is not for the, you know, this, they actually got a grant to create this. So it costs money. It takes a lot of time to plan this. So even though it's really cool in theory, obviously not everyone is going to be making an escape room in their residency. But I did see some simpler versions of escape rooms. Um, this was a zombie cruise ship virtual escape room for point of care ultrasound um, for cardiothoracic. And so I was going to just like walk you through it. It's literally made on a Google Doc, which makes it so easy. Um, if I can find the mouse again, there it is. So it's just a Google Doc and you, you know, you say, um, you know, it says you are enjoying your vacation after successfully graduating from an emergency medicine residency or treating yourself with a party cruise ship to release your stress. When you are about to hit the poolside, you hear an emergency announcement. If there's any available physician, please come to the medical facility immediately. You have a choice here. What do you do? Now nah, I'm on vacation. Now that I'm an attending, I'll only get up when, I, when I'm getting paid or here I go again to save another life. I have to run before someone else gets there. So of course, we're all going to pick the second one. And um, we show, we arrive at the medical facility, introduce ourselves. The cruise doctor appears to be very confused and gives you a brief history. The patient is in Sicily, no pulse. And, you know, so anyway, they give you this patient scenario, you get an EKG um, strip, and then, you know, they ask you that you're going to look at their, um, you know, at their lungs with ultrasound, which probe should you use? So I guess we'll pick the linear probe and we picked the right one. And then, you know, you're going to see, what do you see on your ultrasound when you do it? So they show a clip, they've embedded this YouTube clip of 
a lung ultrasound, which actually we don't really do much in radiology. So I don't know how to read this, but you know, that's what they show. And then you answer the question, what do you see? And um, we're going to put pneumothorax with barcode sign because I've done this before and I know that's the right answer now. Um, and oh no, the zombie is there. <laughs> so, you know, they've, they've made this kind of cute and it's, it's fun to do. And it's, um, you know, instead of just doing a multiple choice test, they've embedded the multiple choice into this kind of like cute scenario um, that people can do like in their own time at home while they're studying. Um, so that's the uh, zombie cruise ship escape room. Um, and then if anyone is interested in creating your own escape room, I found this wonderful resource online, which I can send the link to after if anyone's interested. And it's, even though it's for radiology, it really is applicable to anyone trying to create an escape room. And it's like a five page guide to how to do this, um, which is really, really nice if you're wondering where to get started. Okay, so that was a smattering of ways that you can gamify your education. And some of you, including Robin, are probably wondering, well, like, so what? Does this work? Why, why bother doing this, right? And there have been a lot of sort of reviews and meta-analyses on the, on the data that's out there. And the problem is that, number one, there's a lot of definitions for gamification and what it means to gamify your education and what features were used to gamify the education. Um, and whether different features can have different effects. So there are, it seems that there are so many variables. And the summary of all four, at least of these meta-analyses and reviews that I found was that the results are kind of unimpressive and inconclusive. <laughs> um, as many of us know, there's this Kirkpatrick's pyramid of how we evaluate um, curriculum and training um, methodologies and things like that. And the most commonly evaluated thing is like the student's reaction to the content. Like, did you like it? Were you satisfied with it? Did you think you learned? Like, what is your perception of learning? Were, do you think you were mo more motivated? Um, so this is sort of the lower tier. And this is where almost all of the studies live. And as we know, as educators, sometimes like not to be not to say I know better, but we know that sometimes the easier thing or the more fun thing is not necessarily the best thing for our learning, right? Sometimes it's actually good to struggle a tiny bit when we're learning. It produces longer lasting memories and things like that that has been borne out in the literature. So reaction is great. We want our learners to be happy. We want them to enjoy what they're learning. Obviously, we want them to feel motivated, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're getting the result that we want. The next tier is learning. So this is actually testing knowledge. Did their knowledge improve based on what was provided in the, you know, in this, in the, um, in the research? And um, some of the studies did get to this level where they showed that the learners did learn something, that their knowledge was better after the intervention. Um, sometimes they didn't use a control, so that's not great. And a lot of times that control is not really like an equal control, like giving someone a passive lecture and then giving them a gamified version of the lecture is not exactly the control we're looking for, but maybe if we controlled it against like a different active learning technique, we might be able to tease out whether it's really the gamification or is it just the active learning that improved knowledge. And then nearly none of the studies showed a change in behavior. And then, you know, like the holy grail of medical education, which is very hard to prove, does it actually change like patient outcomes? Does it have results um, that we are really hoping for? And that is very hard to prove. And pretty much none of the studies was able to do that. So I share this because there are some benefits and outcomes that were shown in these studies. The students do like gamification for the most part. Like it was almost unanimous in these studies that students enjoy the gamified version of their learning. They seem to be more engaged in during the content. They report satisfaction. They have sort of positive attitudes about the, the topic. And some of the studies were able to show knowledge gains. So that's something. Um, and I think as a teacher, like at most active learning techniques, we do get real-time feedback when we use a gamified version of learning. And so we can then adjust our content in real time to make it more effective for the learner. So I think there are some real benefits that we can, you know, continue to use these techniques. Um, but there are certainly limitations, like I said. So most of the studies had sort of like a low to moderate methodology as far as like how they ran the study and, you know, what kind of conclusions we can draw from it. 
Most of them were descriptive. They were very small, sort of like pilot studies, so not a large N that we can say, you know, this is definitely something we can prove time and time again would work. Um, as I mentioned, most don't include a control group. Um, the publications almost always focus only on positive results. So there's this question, are we like under or not reporting negative results? Um, and I think there's a very real concern that, especially for certain types of people, competition could really impede learning. Um, you know, it could draw people back in, less wanting to participate, um, especially depending on what the team dynamics are um, with your learners. I think also there's this thought that, you know, it shifts from intrinsic to extrinsic motivation. And I think our current generation of learners really is motivated extrinsically right now, especially, you know, like they're used to getting likes on things and um, comments on their posts and things like that. And so um, I think we should be encouraging intrinsic motivation because that's what gets you through your career. <laughs> um, it's not just like the tests at the end telling you you did a good job or you're attending, giving you good feedback. So um, I think intrinsic motivation is definitely something we want to encourage as teachers. And then as Robin had mentioned, it takes a lot of time to translate pre-existing content to this active learning model, whether it's gamification or other. Um, and so that's definitely um, a, um, sort of a roadblock for a lot of people. And I think I didn't put this here, but to address your other concern is you definitely get through less content when you do active learning. And I think, you know, my theory about this is number one, hopefully you're, you know, I talked about this a lot is like, motivating your learners, getting the learners excited about a topic, hopefully they then go home and read more about it. I don't know if they're doing that. I'd like to think they are. <laughs> um, but also I think, you know, there is this um, idea that like, if you're just doing passive learning, I, I think, you know, people have shown sort of the forgetting curve. The forgetting curve is much steeper for passive learning, lecture-based kind of teaching than active learning style teaching. Um, you retain a lot more. So even though, you might be actually teaching less content, the retention is probably better. Um, so maybe we can sort of rest at night knowing that. <laughs> can I ask it to you? Please, yes. So the first one is, it, at least in radiology, we've now gone to our resident conference model as not just everybody's in the room, but there is a remote element. You mm -hmm. know, people are dialing in. Do you find that these gamific the gamification idea works as well when you're dealing with a hybrid lecture or does that make it like uh we, we just it's really hard to do yeah this is hybrid and so i have to say i don't exactly know at all what people are doing at home hopefully they're paying attention and participating but i think to give full attention to the audience here and not screw up all of my it uh -huh. issues i'm like not clicking around on zoom or right. engaging with the zoom audience really very much so i do think that from that standpoint, it's not as good for these Zoom virtual people. Um, I think it's better if everyone is virtual or right, for the right. people in the There's audience. No hybrid. Yes. It's just, it's one the That's my personal opinion. I don't have any data to back that up. But <laughs> Can I ask one? My, my yeah. other question is that, so this gamification compared to like a didactic lecture, mm -hmm. Um, it seems as though, you know, there are pros and cons for both, but this idea of, are you retaining more if like you're engaging with the material mm -hmm. in a different way? What about, so in radiology, a lot of, we have kind of two models. One is the didactic thing, mm -hmm. but the other is sort of the hot seat mm -hmm. where everybody goes through and it's like, Eric, you take this case, you discuss it, Sarah, you take this case. How about is that? Because that's sort of like an engaging with the material mm -hmm. in a different way than you would the didactic. It's not quite gamification, but is there, do you know just from, from your research in this area, whether that lends itself more to retention of material than just, a, you know, you know, Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> I think like, Anytime you are the one taking the case, you remember that case. Like you probably remember cases from your residency that you got wrong. I bet I remember ones I got wrong <laughs> um, when I was in the hot seat in the room with all my peers. Um, so I do think that there are um, there is something about when you're like actively thinking and and engaging with the material, you learn it better. But for everyone else in the room who's not taking the case, that's just the it's same like as being normal. in a lecture. It's just yeah, normal. perhaps it's. A slightly a leg up because you're hoping that everyone is thinking, you know, reflecting to themselves silently what they think the answer is. So it's maybe minimally more than just like drone, you know, listening to someone drone on about something. Um, but I think for the most part, it's more passive. Yeah. Um, 
I'm almost done actually. So what now? Well, like, what do we do? I probably just excited you about gamification and now I've just totally brought you down. Right. So I, I think there's some backing in educational theory. Like I think Kolb's learning model and I think um, like Anders Ericsson, like the deliberate practice, I think we can use those to assume that some of this really works. Um, but you know, and I think that we can use gamification to supplement our curricula. I don't think our entire curricula should be gamified, but I do think we can use it here and there um, to, to get things across. Um, but I think that there's not enough data really to use it as a primary teaching tactic at this point. But if you use it, get some data, write it up, <laughs> and then we'll know a little bit more. So show of hands, who thinks they'll use gamification in the future? All right. I have some definite yeses and I have some maybes. So that's good. That's what I was hoping for. Um, so that's it. I have, I'm um, happy to take questions from the audience virtually or live. <laughs> Thank you, Shana. That was great. Thank you. Uh, sure, of course. I um, actually got to stay at the mic. Okay. Yes. Great. I, have, I was going to read the questions from the chat. If oh, right. that's good. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. Um, either we can read them or Caitlin, are you, do you want to maybe right. mention okay. a few? Okay. Or, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to bring any up, Karen, that you see? That I don't see any yet. Okay. Um, my... Oh, wait well, a minute. Here we go. This one here, sorry. Um, Satid from Houston says, we use games for pre-session study as part of a flipped classroom so we can spend class time for high-order teaching and learning. This helps us cover all the topics and objectives. And then you get just positive feedback about the whole presentation <laughs> from a few others. Which is great. How do you use it, Shana, or do you use it also? Um, actually, let me start the question over. So, so often with our learners, myself included at times, everyone has their phone out. <laughs> and, and so do you use the process of uh, the phone as a technology educational tool to also control that use? by pulling them into a game and saying, when we're not doing the game though, let's keep your phones down. You know what I'm saying? That's a great point. I've never had to say anything because at least for us, our residency classes are pretty small and they're not always in conference. So I can usually see who's doing what. Um, and if someone's not paying attention, I can usually uh -huh. engage them in uh -huh. some way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for the most part they're paying very close attention <laughs> because there's a prize at the end also what is the i mean everyone has their own different learning curve on this but what is the learning curve do you use for example one tool like poll everywhere most of the time jeopardy most of the time um, and you know what is the uh, the educators kind of curve to get comfortable mm -hmm. with how to use something effectively i I personally think like use what works. So if you have something that works for you, like don't feel like you have to go dabble in something else if it's going to prevent you from actually doing it. Yeah. Um, so I think that Jeopardy template is so easy to use. I feel like anyone could literally like drop and drag old PowerPoints yeah. into it. I think that's a great place to start. Pull Everywhere is pretty easy to use once you have it yep. working. But the biggest hiccup I see is that um, you do need to have it downloaded for it to be working. I think you can do it online, but you know, a lot of times people are like logging into a work computer and might not be able to download it and get it working. So that's the biggest hiccup that I see with yep. Pull Everywhere, even though I think it's otherwise pretty easy. Amanda. Super quick question. Yeah. Um, where does it, like, have you ever experienced any issues with accessibility? Whether it be because somebody doesn't have the right software on their phone or if somebody doesn't, I mean, I know we're kind of phasing out of that, but yeah. doesn't have a phone that'll work with it. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've ever had an issue with Pull Everywhere or Kahoot because it's just a website. So as long as yeah. the Wi-Fi in the building works or people have you know data on their phones, it should I had be fine. one experience with Pull Everywhere not usable outside of the U.S. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, and I wasn't okay. expecting it. I should have known, but yeah, I wouldn't have known that. Yeah, I know <laughs> what a disaster that was. It's some software named uh, Bricas, P L I C E, which is like a uh, Discord. Oh. Okay. So if you wanna show the answer A, you you will be able to show the, the teacher like this. And huh. if B, right B. Oh, oh okay. and, uh, and the teacher can you know um how should I say uh, check the through the your smartphone. Oh wow. Uh, that, that would be really interesting. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In Japan and the nurse the nurses don't have the smartphone while oh. they are you know working. And, yeah. Uh, after the that, you know, that kind of situation, I'll use this one. Oh, wow. Yeah. Huh. Sarah. Oh, no, go ahead. Can can I, go, go yeah, yeah, please. And, uh, I, uh, I'm, 
I think the, uh, the pedagogy itself is too attractive. The runners sometimes focus on the technology. Yes. You know, the other day I used the sprinklers to the my uh, one of my last grades and that the uh, the the questionnaire from the after the of my session, all of them talked about the sprinklers. <laughs> <laughs> Not my. Yes. Yeah. So how, how can we avoid this kind of situation? I think again, like just using something that's simple and works and is easy to use. I think that it will detract from the like the novelty of the technology, and it'll detract from any potential issues that you have with the technology. I think so. Sim think simple is, is better, I think. But I think of it as the game is simply one tool that yeah. you fit into your own learning and teaching process. And so if you use too much of a tool, yeah. you know, too much of any ingredient, <laughs> it doesn't taste good. So, you know, so you kind of use it where you think it fits yeah. things a little bit. But that's a good point. Yeah. Sarah, you have a question? Yeah. Can you talk about having your learners in teams versus individually? Because, you know, certainly in radiology, let's keep talking about radiology, but we have learners at different levels. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's really nice to be in a team, but perhaps people, there'll be people that are, are not engaged right. when they're in a group of team or is there a certain number that's yeah. the right number or should yeah. we always do individual or? I think individual is fine if it's anonymous because I think you don't want to really like set right. residents against each other yeah. in that way. I think teams are better if they're made thoughtfully. So a few years ago, you may remember um, one of our residents and I, we created this like team-based learning technique. And we had um, each team had a resident of each level. So at least then um, there was a first year with a second year, a third year and a fourth year. So it wasn't like a team of all first years who didn't know anything compared yeah. to the fourth years. So I think trying to balance teams is really important. And then even before that, um, when I was a resident, I created this like team based multiple choice challenge where we were creating multiple choice questions based on each lecture that was given. And then there were these quizzes and then there was a final exam and each resident got their own score. And there was a prize for the resident who had the highest score at the end. They got like an extra vacation day, mm -hmm. but no one else knew like only you only knew your individual score. And then there were teams where the scores were added together. Yeah. So no one knew how each individual person was doing, just how the teams were doing. And that was fun because then there was like team pride, but also people wanted that final prize. Um, so there was individual motivation to participate. That's good. Great. Any other online? Karen, anything else? No others. Just everybody really enjoyed this. That was fun. Great. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.